Hello and welcome back to an episode of Generation Films. My name is American Ben, and today I want to shit on home planets. Okay, not quite how I wanted that to come off. What I mean is, I want to tell you which home planets in science fiction are the worst of the worst. Please note that I am from Dagobah West, aka New Jersey, and so I'm aware that I'm throwing stones from a glass house in this video. Or rather, not a house. I'm just outside, wearing tattered rags, knee-deep in a swamp as dangerous bacteria invades my various orifices. Man, I'm in a weird mood today, huh? Now, what makes a planet bad? And particularly a home planet bad? Well, to me, a poor homeworld can entail a variety of attributes, from inhospitable environments, to dangerous native life forms, to blandness, and so on. So things like that are going to be the units of measurement we employ in this video. Anyway, on to our list of the worst home planets in science fiction. But first, on the subject of poorly groomed giant orbs, this video is brought to you by Manscaped.com. Manscaped sent me their new performance package 4.0 as an early Christmas present, and so I'm finally getting my personal belongings into tip-top shape. Manscaped's products are made specifically for men, so if you're the type to let things down below get a little on the wild side, their tools will help you clean up while leaving no battle scars. And if you're shy along with being unkempt, you goddamn hunk, then you'll be happy to know that your Manscaped box will show up at your door in super discreet packaging, so none of your neighbors will think that you've gone crazy and started to groom yourself. Though, I suppose, me letting hundreds of thousands of people know in a YouTube video kind of negates the point of the discreet box, huh? By the way, I do use the Manscaped equipment myself. Don't tell them, but I agreed to this ad just to get the free stuff. The Lawn Mower 4.0 is fantastic. It's a waterproof cordless body trimmer built with advanced skin safe technology, which helps prevent the massive blood loss that I so commonly experienced using my old shaving tools. Oh, and the Lawn Mower 4.0 also has this cool LED light Ooh. and a high tech wireless charging dock to go with it. Along with a lawnmower, Manscaped also sent me their Crop Preserver Below the Waist Deodorant and their Crop Reviver Body Spray, and the two combined to keep your precious areas cool and clean all day long. Mmm, smells like God. There's tons of great items in their Performance Package 4.0, including their Weak Whacker Nose and Ear Hair Trimmer, their new and improved Shears 2.0 Luxury 6-Piece Stainless Steel Nail Kit. And for a limited time, this package includes two additional gifts totally free, the Shed Travel Bag and the Manscaped Anti-Chafing Boxer Briefs, which I wear every day. Once I find a good pair, I stick with it. So get moving, go to manscaped.com and use my promo code GENFILMS to get 20% off plus free international shipping plus two free gifts and get your life and balls in order. Now back to today's video. In seventh place, let's start with the obvious. Tatooine, homeworld of the Jawas and Tusken Raiders. Now, okay, maybe I'm a little bit biased given the amount of Tatooine and desert planets in general I've had to cover on this channel since its inception. That said, Tatooine is especially lifeless and dull. That's its crime. It's just sort of an uninteresting planet. Admittedly, the double suns are cool, but honestly, I'm pale as hell, and I'm pretty sure that means that no suntan lotion in the entire galaxy is going to sufficiently protect me on that godforsaken planet. More importantly, though, the two suns have made the planet a dead zone on which little vegetation grows, and there's not enough surface water to sustain a population. And yet, a population lives there, thanks in part to moisture farms that draw water from the atmosphere. Just imagine how boring a conversation with a moisture farmer is. And of course, because of the lack of resources, Tatooinians produce little technology in-house. Rather, they must rely on imports to sustain and defend their population. The scarcity of resources on the planet means that it doesn't draw much attention tension from the core worlds or galactic government, and thus it has largely been neglected throughout its history, or at least for the length of time it's been a desert planet. And then to top things off, a super cringe moment took place on Tatooine at the end of the Rise of Skywalker, and so now the planet is etched into my memory as an unholy, decrepit wasteland. Still, it has a special place in my heart, as it does for all Star Wars fans. In sixth place is Krypton. 
the home world of the eponymous Kryptonians. Most noteworthy among them, the famous sociopath Kal-El, better known to humans as Superman. Now, I have nothing bad to say about Krypton's aesthetic beauty. Its natural environments were a marvel, from the firefalls to the jewel mountains to the valley of Juru, all which emitted a celestial glimmer in the light of the planet's sun, the red star Rao. However, Krypton was a problematic homeworld for a couple of reasons. First, during its primordial era, a host of organisms evolved on the planet which were known to be some of the most dangerous life forms in the entire universe. And fair, such ferocious wildlife probably helped to cultivate the godly power of the Kryptonians, but still, many of the organisms on the planet, many of which were present up until the day of its destruction, were deadly, even to the mighty humanoid denizens of Krypton. Thought beasts, for instance, who are capable of telepathy and mostly prefer to eat plants, were known to feed on Kryptonians from time to time. However, the major reason Krypton makes this list is that its surface housed a progressively destabilizing uranium core. Jor-El, Superman's father, discovered this and even foresaw that eventually the core would erupt and lead to a massive nuclear explosion, but he was not able to convince the authorities on the planet in time that the matter was urgent enough to evacuate the Kryptonians. Moral of the story? Okay, well, don't deny science, but also planets that have unstable uranium cores are not likely to make for successful homeworlds. In fifth place, we have M6117, or planet number two in pitch black, home to a few different species, the most prominent of which are the vicious and lethal bioraptors. If you thought Tatooine's two sons were difficult to deal with, well, M6117 or M6117, don't kill me if I'm getting this wrong, I don't remember what they called it in the damn movie, is dead smack between three suns, exposing the surface to constant daylight. M6117 certainly wouldn't make a good base for humans. It has a dry, desert-like surface, lacks much in the way of oxygen and water, and boasts very little plant life. And most of the animal life has been wiped out by bioraptors, who emerge from the ground during the occasional total eclipse and massacre every life form in sight, to be fair, also what I do during eclipses. So I think we can also safely say that M6117 is not a great home planet for any of its native species outside of its alpha predators. Cetaceans, for instance, large land-based herbivorous creatures that called the planet home are no more thanks to the bioraptors. However, the reason this planet is on the list is that, well, it doesn't even seem to be a hospitable environment for its strongest species. Bioraptors are extremely photosensitive. Even the slightest ray of light can deliver severe burns to their bodies. So it doesn't really sound like the best place for them to settle is on a planet that's abutted by three suns and sits in constant daylight. The bioraptors have adapted by learning to do all of their hunting during the rare total eclipse, but it sure as hell seems like they would do better elsewhere. You know, in a place where there's less light, or even better, in a place where organisms can reproduce more easily and thus provide a constant source of food for the perpetually famished beasts. M6117 is just a bad place for anyone and anything that's ever had the misfortune of existing upon its surface. In fourth place, we have the Ecumenopolis, or planet-wide city, of Apocalypse, the homeworld of the Lowlies, or Lowlies, someone correct me on that, a semi-race of slaves that make up the majority of the population of the planet. Now, we don't need to say much about the planet's environs. Its surface comprises a series of fire pits in the vein of Star Wars's Mustafar, but on Apocalypse, only its ruler, the supervillain Darkseid, a personification of pure hatred, is privileged with the high ground. Covered in fire and ash as it is, the planet is not only void of agriculture and natural resources, but it's also just a plainly depressing place. There's no thriving population there. Instead, every being on the planet is either one of the lucky few to help make up the tyrannical ruling class, or is another cog among the masses of lowlies who slave away to advance the devilish aims of Darkseid for the entirety of their lives. The lowlies, lowlies, whatever, have no concept of self-worth and have been completely broken inside and out. I suppose it's not really fair to call Apocalypse the homeworld of the low lies, being that many of them are kidnapped slaves from elsewhere, but being that they do compose most of the population of the world and produce offspring who are native to the planet, it 
is their home, and it does not bode well for them that their home is all fire and brimstone and is built to keep them toiling away till death does them part from hell. In third place, we have Mars in The Expanse. In The Expanse's vision of the future, humanity has factionalized across the Sol system into three major groups. Earthers, who have citizenship on and loyalty to Earth, Martians, who are born on or emigrated to Mars, and Belters, rockhoppers who live on asteroid-based space stations around the asteroid belt. Human society on Mars originally was a colony of Earth, but as time wore on and the Martians developed a unique identity from Earthers and a nascent but fervent nationalism, they began to pursue self-sovereignty and broke away from their origin planet. Thus, in the Expanse, we get to see what a fully independent human-ruled Mars might look like. However, it remains a sort of terrible place to live. The Martians are amidst a terraforming project that has spanned generations and holds no promise of completion anytime soon. This undertaking is unfathomably massive in scope, requiring that nearly every facet of society be committed to its progress in some way. Therefore, Martian life is consumed by the dream of making Mars a habitable environment, and because of this Martian life, can be really harsh, even a bit brutal, as no individual is bigger than this collective aspiration to prove to the denizens of the Sol system that Martians are capable of turning Mars into a veritable wonderland. As so much of society is committed to a higher purpose, there isn't much opportunity for individual prosperity. Poverty and crime are rampant, and the population is too apathetic, disillusioned, and, to be honest, even complicit to do anything about it. And spoiler alert, Many Martians are now taking off for other, more habitable planets thanks to the discovery and awakening of the Ringgate system, a sort of portal allowing for fast travel through the Sol system. The failure of Mars feels mostly due to the fact that it was a bad place to try and build a society in the first place, as the technology available to humans in the time the Expanse takes place, the 24th century, is not nearly sufficient to sustain a population on the planet. In second place, we have Terra from 40K. Yes, I'm speaking of our current home planet Earth, but in a very different form. Terra, by the time we reach the 42nd millennium, has been ravaged from pole to pole over and over again. It was first crippled in ancient times by a series of catastrophic wars that historians hypothesize involved the frequent use of immeasurably powerful weapons. Then, when the emperor of mankind arose to unite humanity, he began the process of rebuilding the Earth back from ashes, and its people back from the techno-barbarian savages they had been reduced to. However, with the onset of the Horus Heresy, a galactic conflict that saw traitor space marine legions break away from the Imperium and ally with chaos to destroy it, Terra was devastated once again. Horus's forces heavily bombarded the planet, destroying its surface and much of what stood upon it. There have been attempts to rebuild it since, but ultimately the planet has become a dystopian industrial hellscape, which has left its surface and atmosphere dangerously polluted. The hordes of lower class serfs that live on the planet are crammed into factories in massive hive cities and work to keep the Imperium's unwieldy bureaucracy running. Overall, though, the planet is now essentially a giant monument to the Eternal Emperor, who is pretty much just a pile of bones sitting upon a cybernetic golden throne that supposedly keeps him animated to some infinitesimal degree. Terra is a holy and sacred place to man, but only as a symbol, not as a functioning base of operations. And were secular technocrats to be handed the reins of the Imperium rather than megalomaniacal religious zealots, they would most likely designate it for exterminatus. Oh, oh, sorry, guys. Wait one second. Uh, there's a knock on my door. Hello. The in, the inquis the Inquis Inquisition. I'm I'm actually kind of uh, in the middle of something. Uh, can I just finish it uh, first? R real quickly. Yeah. Th thanks. Sorry guys, I'm gonna have to rush through the rest of this video here. Uh, finally, in first place, we have Arrakis from Dune, the homeworld of the Atreides. I hope that's how you pronounce that one. One of the major houses in the galactic Padishah Empire, or Human Imperium. You just knew I had to make a desert planet number one on this list. Arrakis is a Dune-ridden hellhole. It has an extremely harsh environment best described as absolutely not but more easily understood as blisteringly hot, dry, and though the native life there is limited due to the climate, it's full of things that will eat you like a peanut. Another reason that native life there is limited. 
The giant sandworms that lurk beneath Arrakis's deserts are extremely territorial, and at the sense of the slightest vibration will rise to the surface to destroy all who encroach upon its slumber, no questions asked. As you've probably already guessed, natural resources are not in abundance on Arrakis either, and given the harsh environment there, they're very badly needed. Unfortunately, Arrakis is also positioned far from major populated worlds, and thus is outside of commercial trade routes that would otherwise bring needed goods to the planet. Now, I imagine that you'll point out that while Arrakis might be an exceptionally inhospitable planet for life forms, it does exclusively possess the most important resource in the entire known universe, that is, spice melange, a synonym flavored narcotic that is a product of sandworm fungal excretions and water, and which has life-extending and psychic-enabling properties. And then again, more practically, it can be converted into a gas that allows for interstellar travel to be possible. Thus, one would think that settling on a planet with such an invaluable resource would be a good idea, but in reality, spice melange only compounds upon the planet's harsh environment to make it even more of a hellhole than it already is. It's good for one's home planet to be endowed with some useful natural resources, but perhaps not a resource as powerful as Melange, which in effect makes Arrakis a loci of total war. Arrakis's special spice makes the Middle East oil look comparatively worthless, as every space Dick Cheney near and far descends upon the planet in the hopes of mining and controlling it. Anyways, that is my list of the worst home planets in science fiction. If you enjoyed the video, please do give it a big thumbs up and comment down below. Let me know what I got wrong, what I got right, and what I completely left out of this video. Remember to subscribe to this channel and hit that notification bell so you don't miss a damn thing. For now, my name is American Ben, and I'll catch you next time. Well, maybe. Let's just see what this guy at the door wants. Generation Films. Peace.